another phenomenal podcast for you today. Thank you all for joining us. Thanks for tuning in last night to our last live HootNet trip of the year. It was a great success. A lot of viewers, a lot of people. I mean, the lobsters didn't cooperate, but at the end of the day, Justin had just the most phenomenal season ever in the history of lobster fishing. So we're very proud of that. And we're very proud of all our viewers and all our followers. So thank you all very, very much. And all the stars and all the love that we felt from all of you. We appreciate it. And Justin made a vow last night. He's going to start doing live fishing trips. He's going to be doing his live stuff from out there, halibut fishing and rockfish fishing and all that stuff. So it's not over by any stretch of the imagination. It's just the uh, lobster season's over. Tonight's the last night, but it's Justin's anniversary. So he's not going live tonight. And we can't seem to get Pablo to go live. So we're just going to have to see what he posts on the website tomorrow and see what he catches. But gang, today is Akuma Wednesday. We always talk about Akuma products on Wednesday. And then we always bring in our good friend, Bill Varney. And he's say, telling me it's beautiful there where he's at in Colorado. So we're going to bring Bill in in just a minute. Those of you that haven't watched the show before, I just want to let you know the first half hour today is going to be a little political. I talked about it this week. We kind of we kind of been straying away from the political part of this, but gang fishing is 1000% political now. Un unfortunately, I know that we all want to just go out fishing and relax from the politics, but it 100% affects us on a daily basis. So, if that's not what you want to hear about, maybe you tune in at the 12:30 the halfway point, we'll jump back into the surf. But we got to talk about this because the rockfish regulations came out a couple days ago. That's super important. And this windmill thing is coming down the pipe here full speed. They're going to shut down a massive area off of Morro Bay where uh, all the albacore have been spawning since the beginning of time. That's going to be taken away. And uh I don't want to get too far along here without bringing in my good buddy, Bill, because he's the, got the voice of reason, the kinder, softer way to talk about it. You know me, I'm like a bull in a china shop. So let's bring Bill in before I put my foot in my mouth. Bill, welcome. Thank you for joining hey. us. Hey, hey, Dave. Hey, everybody. Good to see you today. Happy Another Wednesday. Another beautiful Wednesday. Absolutely. Great Wednesday. And Bill... We're going to talk a little bit politics here. I got a message the other day from one of my followers that said, uh, you got to quit beating up on the other, the, the other side. And there's gang, I'm sorry. We got to be honest. And all Bill and I have is our honesty. There's one side. I'm not going to say what side. I don't want a bunch of people crying. There's one side that wants to close everything. There's one side that doesn't care that doesn't care, that they, they care about the things that matter. One side cares about what matters. One side wants to close every single thing with zero science, gang. You got to pick a side, gang. You got, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, but it comes down to, Bill, who you voted for. And it's sad Absolutely. to think about Absolutely. it like that. But gang, there's one side that is on a mission to close everything and be in total control of every movement that you make at all times. And that's just the way it is, gang. And uh, I think it's kind of tragic that they did slip this rockfish thing in again on us. And people aren't even paying attention because everybody's all ready to go bluefin fishing, Bill, because that's what they're looking at. But it looks to me, Bill, that... Uh, Steve Carson sent me the new regulations. I know that they're not out yet, but we got a sneak preview. It looks like they're closing the rockfish this year on August 16th instead of September 16th like they did last year. And I know you're all going, well, they, they, they're going to keep it open 50 fathoms or deeper. Gang, it really messes up the whole thing for Southern California. And it's done with 0.0, .0 science. <sighs> So, Bill, you're on the inside with CCA. You attend a lot of the meetings. I know Wayne's just buried. He wants to be with us on the show, but he's mm -hmm. in multiple meetings a day, and he's having a hard time getting on here. Can you talk about any of this at all? Do you have any information about the rockfish thing? 
You know, I don't have a lot of information about the rockfish situation, but go, going back to certainly what you said about, you know, whether it's based on science or it's not based on science, well, it's really not based on science at all. Um, and, and that's what's so difficult. And of course, you know, if, when we look at rock fishing and we look at boats that are going out of San Diego, you know, they don't have a great desire to be out in the spring and the middle of the summer and rock fishing. They're going to be out there yellowtail and bluefin and yellowfin fishing and dorado fishing and looking for kelp patties. But when you're looking at um, landings like Avila Bay, Morro Bay, Central California, San Francisco, these, these are areas that all the time fish rockfish. And for them to go out to 300 plus feet and fish during when it's open in 300 feet and fish those areas, it really messes up the anglers because, you know, we've had probably... Oh my gosh, like 20 or 30 years of fishing in shallow water for rockfish once we figured out how to catch them in shallow water. And now they got to go out and use new equipment. They can only do five or six drops a day because it's, you know, they're bringing up two or three pound sash weight or five pound sash weight off the bottom at 300, 350, 400 feet. How many times can you do that in one day? So it's like this attrition situation where, where they're like, we're not going to close it down, but we're, it's kind of like ammunition, but we're going to make it so difficult for you to do it that you're just going to lose interest. And it has really hurt a lot of the ang uh, the landings in, in Central California, and it continues to do so. I don't see any end in sight with this. Yeah, the really sad thing, Bill, is, yeah, we talk about the landings, we talk about, but you know what? Like my father used to say, you can't talk about the landing. It, this affects everyone, the, the Ma and Pa coffee shop, the donut shop, the liquor store, the place that sells the ice, the place that that uh, you buy your fishing licenses and the tackle stores, it, it affects the tackle manufacturers. It affects every single human being that lives in the United States of America. Unfortunately, people don't, they have such a, a, a closed sight on what's going on. And Doreen, yeah, California, but you know what? This rockfish thing is federally mandated. This is a federal deal. So you can blame the state of California, but gang, when you get down to the nitty gritty, they're on a mission to close fishing in the United States of America. I've had Tommy Gomes on here. I've had, I've had many, many people on here that have told you, I don't care if you guys are living in Washington, you're living in Florida, you're living in California, you're living in Oregon, Washington, Alaska. They do not want the United States of America fishing, period. Even though we're the largest and gang, this will blow your mind if you haven't listened to me before. We're the largest consumers of seafood in the world. No one eats more seafood than the United States of America. But we're not allowed to fish for our seafood. And the little bit of seafood that we are allowed to fish with, you and I and Bill can't afford it because our commercial fishermen are so overregulated and underpaid that they have to sell it to the foreign markets mm -hmm. because Bill and Dave and Doreen and... Tim, we're going to the fish market and we're looking and we're going, huh? How, why is that locally caught shrimp $4 or $5 more a pound than the garbage coming from Taiwan? But we don't even slow down and think about it. We're like, oh, no, no, no. Give me that. Give me that shrimp. That's $2 a pound. I can't afford the $6 a pound shrimp. $6 a pound shrimp is coming from America. And why is it more? And I'm and I'm not even the prices are just numbers I'm throwing out there, gang. But the reason it's more is because the regulations are just astronomical. So when you you hear the word science in close of fisheries, that just lets you know right there that it's all just a bunch of crap. It's all a bunch of lies, gang. And it comes down to the end of the day who you vote for period, end of story. There's nothing else. We can't sugarcoat it. We can't make it all that. So if you're on that other side, and I'm not here to say what side, because I don't want to lose half my audience, but half of you are, if you're fishermen or you're engaged in the act of fishing and you're voting for the other side, I don't get it. I don't understand it. It doesn't make any sense to me. And I, the only reason I'm even saying this is because I had a member, a follower, call me up and say, Dave, you got to stop talking about the other side. We're doing the best we can, but they're not. They're doing it with no science. It's about control. I'm sorry. I don't want to. 
Oh, it's so sad. It just, I can't imagine, Bill, not being able to take my grandkids fishing. Well, you know, Dave, what's so difficult about it and, and, and the way that science for marine biology is, is not only accepted, but, but how it's done is through a sampling. So, for example, let's say, for example, that they're going to figure they want to figure out what Corbina eat. So what they do is they go do a sampling, which would be maybe a mile stretch of California's thousands of miles of beach. Right. They're going to do a maybe a hundred yard stretch. And then based on what they net or catch or whatever system they're using for their for scientific evaluation at that time is they're going to take that information and they're going to extrapolate it out over the entire West coast. When we go to, when we're talking about bluefin and pelagic fish over the whole Pacific ocean, and they're going to say, well, we have this sampling in this small area. And based on this sampling, this is how we look at the entire biomass. Now, when it comes to rockfish, they are absolutely everywhere. And, and and I can guarantee you this. I, I have fished, as you know, Dave, the entire coast of Baja from, from the border at the Tijuana Slough all the way around Cabo up to La Paz. And, you know, we have been calico bass fishing at Sacramento Reef in like, it must have been maybe 35 feet deep there. And the number of Boccaccio and Reds in 35 feet of water, because because we're always assuming that, you know, we're rock fishing. We're we're in 100, we're in 200, we're in 500 feet of water. These fish are in 30 feet of water. They're in 400 feet of water and they're everywhere in between. They're all along the West Coast. So when they come up with these numbers, once again, they're based on the sampling that they do. And based on the sampling itself, it's not indicative in all cases. And I would really go out on a limb and say, in most cases, it's not indicative of what's going on underneath the water. There's been very little science done very little money spent on figuring out what the biomass is and the bioenvironment for all of these different fish that they're regulating. So it is it is very frustrating. Yeah, and they're getting ready. This 30 by 30 that yeah. got kind of laid down to bed last year. And it got a bunch of steam during the, the pandemic. It got a ton of steam and it was hauling ass down the tracks and then they looked at it and they were like, well, wait a minute, we, we, we need a little bit more time now because everything's coming together. So they put it down, they let, pretty much laid it down in a bed and covered it up with a blankie. But I've tried to warn everybody that it's coming back like you can't even believe. Well, here it is. It's back. And my good friend Jimmy Gonzalez just said, hey, do you know they're getting ready to shut down all of San Diego? Yeah, I know. They're getting ready to shut down another 30% of California to act not only – those of you in the salt water, but they're going to get you fresh water guys too. And you don't understand it. And I'm sorry, but I'm going right back. We can fix all this at the polls gang. I'm sorry. Let the, <laughs> let's be honest. There's one side that'll just go, okay, enough is enough. Let's stop this madness. Let's let America fish. And then the other side like, no, no, it's the end of the world. We have to close everything gang. It's not, you can fix it, but you're not going to fix it by sucking your thumb and voting for who you keep voting for, gang. I'm sorry. I'm just being honest. At the end of the day, all I got is my honesty. I haven't said the word. You can figure it out on your own. Make your own assumptions. But uh, there's one side that wants it more than they want anything. And there's one side that says there's so many other problems right now. We need to worry about the other stuff. and Forget about if Bill and Dave can go catch a red rockfish. But it's everything. Gang, it's everything. And Bill Varney, whole career right now is set up on surf fishing. Well, he's not going to get to surf fish, and you're not going to get to surf fish, and we're not going to get to surf fish, which has 0.0, .0 impact on the population of the fish in the ocean. But they're going to take that away. That's going to leave too. And then, Bill, did you ever go up to Mammoth? Did you ever go up to Bishop? Did you ever go trout fishing when you were little? Or yeah, absolutely. It used to have a place up there. Away. They're taking that away. That's They're right. They're taking that away, gang. Your mammoth, your all that area, all that bitching. Go hiking and go catch a golden trout and do all. They're taking all that. It's going. 
And like Todd Manser said at the at the PCS show, this 30 by 30, when it happens and it looks like it's going to happen, then you know what they're going to say? 50 by 50. They're not going to stop. They're just not going to stop. You got to stop voting. You got to stop voting for booger eaters. I'm sorry. You got to stop. Oh, uh, and, and, and you we, know, you know, Dave, if I, if I could just add, you know, that I want you to there, they have already, and, and, and this started a long time ago, but they have already mm -hmm. begun to take away a lot of surf fishing spots. And, you know, if you think about all the MPAs, which have close shore fishing or surf fishing, you could look at Palos Verdes, you could look at Zuma Beach and, and, and Big Dune, Little Dune, which were two of the best places ever for fishing for sea bass from shore. No question about it. That's all closed. You look down at Swami's, it's closed. But, you know, think about it. You add to that the de facto closures, all, almost all, if not all, of Camp Pendleton, Vandenberg Air Force Base, Hollister Ranch, and the Coho ranch um the property that's owned up in cambria that's a private beach property which is 12 miles long there has been quite de facto wise and and just straightforward mpa closures there's been tens of, of dozens of miles if not hundreds of miles already closed in the state of California and along the West Coast. So as time goes on and they take little portions more and more and more, you're going to be squeezed down to less and less places to fish. And really some of the places they take took, and, and, and uh, Palos Verdes is a good example, Laguna is a good example, there was so little pressure there, hardly anybody would go fishing there i would go up to marine land and hike down on the rocks below marine land and go fishing and we're going way back to the 1960s all the way through the current closure and if i saw one or two people down there fishing on the rocks it was a lot of people i mean there was nobody there was absolutely nobody we have got to do our best to put our foot down about this stuff not only do we have to join cca not only do we have to vote correctly but we really need to voice our opinion about our rights as a citizen for paying taxes we're the ones who own the land the public land in california it's not our government employees it's us and we need to step forward and let our voices be known absolutely bill i'm a hundred percent about that and i'm trying so hard to wake everybody up and let them understand and i know that there's people that i don't want to talk about politics but unfortunately it comes right down to surf fishing it's all politic political now it's got nothing to do with the fish gang and then there's another thing that's about to happen bill and i were talking about it right before we went live and i'm watching my good friend Dave Marciano and Paul Hebert and Tyler McLaughlin, those guys are talking about it now. Where I rattled the cage a year and a half ago and I was like, we all got to talk about it. But this, I don't want to use bad words because there's a lot of children watching, but this uh, green deal that's coming down the pipe with these windmills that do not work, it's proven they don't work. And if you guys have information telling you they work, well, you got it from somebody that's not telling you the truth, but they're about to plant a 30 mile square area off of this, off of central California coast. And, uh, McLaughlin, Tyler McLaughlin and, and Marciano and, uh, Hebert are all talking about the amount of whales that are washing up on the beaches over in, uh, over in New Jersey and up and down the Eastern seaport there. No one's it's not on the news. And then Tyler posted a phenomenal picture a couple of days ago of the massive amounts of dead birds, just mind numbing amount of dead birds. Now, Bill and I, yeah, we're old. We remember when nature was the most important thing. And we were told that the birds mattered and the whales mattered and the dolphins mattered and all these animals mattered. But all of a sudden now to these extremists, None of these animals matter. It's the only thing that matters is getting rid of the only thing that sustains a uh, uh, um, 
civilization is oil. I'm sorry. I didn't say the word. But you're not going to get away from it, gang. You're not going to get away from it in your lifetime, my lifetime, Bill's lifetime. It's not going to happen. And this green thing they're trying to shove down your throat is the worst thing in the world for the environment. But they're so invested in it, Bill, that they can't come off of it no matter how many whales and how many dolphins and how many birds they kill. Can you talk? I'm sorry. I'll throw that at you. And I want to hear your side. Well, you know, it's, it's they're almost like drug addicts. I mean, to be honest with you, this whole thing about them moving forward with something that, you know, esoterically has some really good points about it, but but realistically, it's got a lot of bad points, which they didn't maybe know. I mean, I'll give them credit and say maybe they weren't familiar with all the things that might happen. But once they had 20, you know, huge whales wash ashore, thousands of birds die, all of these issues with sea lions and, and seals, you think they would have like come to their senses. But of course, that never happened. So if everybody will bear with me for a second as I go to some of my notes here, you know, if we go back to um, what's going to go on up in, in central California, and for example, we're, we're looking at um, Morro Bay, the area around Morro Bay where, where they're going to put these offshore wind farms, it covers three, not 30, but 376 square miles. Oh, and geez. that area where they're planning to put it in off of Morro Bay, there's been numerous um, commercial anglers, commercial fishermen um, who have been doing it for 50 years, who said this one specific area is where the bluefin, the yellowfin, and the albacore come to spawn. It was one of the only areas in the world where all three types of tuna come together. And they're really kind of plunking this down right in the middle of it. It's going to be completely off limits for any boats to get near it. And, and what really one of the major problems, although there's many, is that these windmills, they're fish aggregating devices because of the vibration that they give off A and because of the fact that they provide shade, which will attract bait fish. Many of these tuna and other pelagic fish will come into that area beneath them and anglers won't be able to get within miles of that area where they're aggregate fish away from where the anglers could have caught them. So a group in, in, in San Luis Obispo um, came out. I'm, I'm looking uh, for their name now. They're, they're the Responsible Energy Adaptation for California's Transition Alliance. Man, what a title. React. And they came out and they said all of the things that we basically learned over the last couple of years on the East Coast, that the soundings that they're using to determine what not only what's on the bottom they're trying to see if there's rocks down there or there's shipwrecks or whatever but they're also being able to look under the surface of the bottom to find out if there's rock or sand or whatever so they can try to figure out how to cable down these these giant windmills which they can't anchor to the bottom because it's far too deep there because of the continental shelf so they're coming out and they're saying re react is saying that you know we've seen on the east coast all these deaths of whales and other animals we have a lot of environmentalists that are on quote unquote that are on our scientists that are on our side that are saying these are going to hurt the whales and so forth so what does the san luis obispo tribune do the newspaper do well they do exactly what most of the mainstream media does and this is what they came out and said they said these local groups such as Responsible Offshore Development Alliance, American Coalition for Ocean Protection, and Save Right Whales, were, were partially funded by climate change denying and right-wing think tanks, such as the Texas Public Policy Foundation, Caesar Rodney Institute, Heartland Institute, and the Texas Public Policy Foundation, to, to fund them in order to fight them against this. So they immediately went on the political side and said, oh, it's all these right-wingers. It's all these climate deniers. They, they, these people have never come forward and said, we're denying climate change or we're right-wingers. They're just coming forward saying, we're trying to save the animals. Let's do our best to do that and let's try to keep it open for fishing. And that really 
tells us exactly what's going on and, and really has what has been going on for some time here in California. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Bill, you, you, you have a great way to say it. And all those, those words that these companies try to are groups, you want to say, they throw out so much garbage in their, in their title. And by the mm -hmm. time most of us won't even read the title because we'll, and that's what they're planning on and hoping for mm -hmm. is that we're like, we're not reading this title that the, the titles are just ridiculous. And the things that they're trying to tell everybody are absolutely ridiculous. And uh, uh, Noah came out with something saying, and Noah's on the take, Noah's being funded by these environmentalists. And they came out and said that they see zero correlation between the windmills and the death of the whales. Well, right there, I'm sorry. I already know you're lying, Noah. I know you're lying because the guys like myself and you and Tyler McLaughlin and Dave Marciano and Paul Hebert that are on the water every day, they see it. And Noah's supposed to be the gatekeeper of all the ocean. They're supposed to be the gatekeeper and they are on the take like you can't even believe. And I'm sorry, I'm right here, Noah. Call me, send me a letter. But you're on the take. If you're saying there is no correlation to the death of the whales and the seabirds, where you have these windmills, we already all know you're full of baloney. We already know that. And I would love to use bigger, meaner words, but I'm not going to because of the children that are watching and listening. But I can't imagine that any of you think this is a good idea. And I can't imagine that you guys going to keep voting for who you're voting for. I'm sorry. At the end of the day, this comes down to who you're voting for. And I don't care, Jason, if you could feed your family with fish out of the ocean for the rest of your life, they're going to close it. It doesn't matter. They're going to close it. They're, they're on a mission to stop fishing, period, end of story. I have to do, I have to pay some bills real quick. Watch this video, gang, and we'll be right back with Bill. And we're going to, we already covered this. We've talked about it. We got you all woken up. Share this with all your friends. Let your friends know what's going on. This is what's going on in your state of California. This is what's going on in your state of Florida, New Jersey, wherever you live. They're closing fishing. But watch this video because we're going to talk about fishing for the rest of the show. I'm sorry. I told you the first half was going to be the way it is. But watch. Hey, guys. This is John Bretza, Director of Product Development for Okuma Fishing Tackle. What we have here is an addition to the Tesoro spinning reel line. This is a new 6,000 size that all you've been waiting for. Great reel for all those guys down in the southeast or the northeast that want to go target you know, big fish on lighter tackle. The 6,000 size holds 290 yards of 30 pound braid or 195 yards of 50 pound braid. It's packed with features. It's all Luma light construction, body, side plate, and rotor. It's got the IPX7 full waterproof body, so if this thing gets submerged, you're going to have no issues at all with it fishing. As far as a drag system, it features a carbonite drag system with a maximum 33 pounds of drag pressure, so a tremendous drag output. So say you're going to take this and fish a, a small, medium-sized tarp, and you're going to have a pulling power with this reel. The best feature it has is it has Okuma's new flight drive system. So that's going to give you that really smooth operation so it feels good all day long when you're on the water. And one of the things when you're fishing braided line, there's a lot of stress placed on any reel regardless of you know brand or manufacturer. The one thing that we equipped this reel to make the Tesoro different is that instead of a stainless steel spool shaft, we used a titanium spool shaft. So this thing's super strong, super durable, but it's also something that's never going to corrode. This uh, little 6,000 size reel has a dual and reverse, and it's all machine cut gearing, uh, machine cut brass, main gear, and penny gear. The Tesoro 6000 has a 6.2 to 1 gear ratio, and that has 41.3 inches of line pickup. The entire reel weighs in at only 15.8 ounces. This reel is going to retail for $359. And one thing that's unique about this reel that's different than the larger Tesoros is that when you flip that bale over, and you turn the handle, the bale's gonna automatically engage. On the larger sizes, most anglers don't want that feature, but this is more universal for live baiting and casting and jigging. So we put that feature into this 6,000 size. If you wanna find out more information on the new Tesoro 6000, check it out at okumafishingusa.com or go see it at a local retailer near you. Thanks, gang, for staying with us through all the all the stuff and the commercial there with John Bretza, and that reel is phenomenal. We talked about those last week, Bill. 
and how cool that reel would be for fishing down here for that bigger fish. That area where John's at right there, that Dana Point area, that cove right there, the rocks, all that stuff. Is that going to be where you're going to use one of those uh, sidewinder crabs? You bet. Uh, you bet. That's exactly where like the sidewinder that. is going to be used. And, and, and a lot of times, you know, I'll fish a, a, a rocky area like that. I learned this in Hawaii you, using a bobber, you, using a, uh, a bobber that you fill with water. And then you've got maybe a five, six, seven foot leader and then cast it out and slowly retrieve it over the top of that reef. And those fish will come out and just nail that thing. I um, like that. The bobber thing, gang. That's yeah. Because that'll yeah. keep you out of getting snagged on the rocks the whole time. Exactly, exactly. And it'll keep your bait in the zone. That's the thing. I learned that in Hawaii. You know, I was I was stuck on the – I kept getting, <clears throat> of course, you know, stuck in the reef there and fishing Hawaii. Uh, Kauai is one of my favorite islands to fish. And I, I had a, like a really cool hat on. I got it over here somewhere. Oh, here, here let me grab it real quick. <laughs> so I had this. I was went into the local tackle shop. And I was wearing this cap. I went into the local town. I went in there and I said to the guy, hey, you know, I've been surf fishing around here. And man, there's good fishing. There's, it's incredible. And I said, I can't believe how many fish I caught. And I, I had to buy a book. There were so many different fish. And he said, well, what'd you catch? Did you catch any of those fish that looked like that one on your hat? And I go, oh yeah, I caught a, I caught a whole bunch like this. And he said, well, I hope you let him go right away. And I said, well, well, I did, but why is that? And he said, well, that's our state fish here in Hawaii. It's against a lot of catch that. <laughs> so, yeah, those bobbers help you. So he explained to me in the islands here, whether you're at the East Cape or you're in Palos Verdes or you're down in, in Dana at the Dana Headlands fishing or anywhere over a rocky area, the reef, you're going to have much more success than using a sinker um but but just real quick dave going back to just real quickly here not to bore everybody about this whole noah situation and about telling the truth and all of that stuff um it was just announced a week ago that noah received a 24 million dollar grant to study salmon in the west and where did that $24 million come from? It came from the, are you ready for this? Yeah. It came I, I from the know. Inflation Reduction Act. All of that money that they told you that has caused all this inflation in our country that was going to be used to reduce inflation is now being used for such things as scientific study of salmon things that cause inflation is what that money is being used for they went on and on and told us how that money was used as a inflation reduction act money and now we've learned that some of it 24 million has been given to noaa for scientific research That's what is some of that other trillions of dollars been used for god knows other other countries other than the United States of America. That's Look, right. People who hate us. Yeah. We got to give, we got to take care of them. Yeah. I'm sorry. We're not talking politics. <laughs> We're talking fish and bill. You and I, we both agree on this one. You guys got to stop voting for those booger eaters. You have to. I don't care what side you're on. If you're a fisherman, you can't be on the other. You can't. You just can't. It's just impossible because they're going to take it all away from you and you're going to be standing there going, how'd this happen? Well, you voted for it. Uh, uh, uh. I'm sorry. And, and Noah, Noah's our gatekeeper of the ocean. They've been mm -hmm. the gatekeeper since I was a little kid. They're, they're the mm -hmm. ones, they're the ones that mm -hmm. set the, they're the ones that have done all the, re well, they're not doing it anymore. Now they're just running on that political dollar who gives them the most money. That's who they're going to believe. And I'm That's sorry, true. but back to surf fishing. So yeah. these areas like where all that rock is that we just showed you with John Brett's at Dana Point. That's like a beautiful place. And, and there's not a lot of that left. If you move up from Dana Point, you get to go through Salt Creek, Monarch Bay, and then that's that. They closed that giant area from Monarch Bay all the way to Abalone Point, which 
If you guys have never Google Earthed it, you might want to look at it. It is absolutely spectacular there. And for mm. very many years, when I ran sport boats for my family out of Dana Wharf, everybody burned rubber and went south. I always went north because if the fish didn't bite, at least my clients got to look at some of the most beautiful scenery in the state of California. So I always had that in my back pocket. But if you could put together a good cast, you could catch fish in Laguna all year long. There's so much fish there. And now it hasn't been touched in 20 years and it's not going to get touched forever. And uh, that's sad. But as you move up the coast from Abalone Point up to Newport, you have all those bitch and rock areas there that you could mm -hmm. wait on the fish. You have much information between Abalone Point and Newport Breakwallville. Oh, oh yeah i mean um so if you go to kind of like downtown a little bit past downtown or before depending which direction you're going in laguna you had brook street there which was one of the greatest corbina fishing spots ever i mean you, you go back to the 30s with my dad and he would tell you about corbina fishing there and then of course um just south of newport harbor there corona del mar beach one of the most phenomenal surf fishing spots ever all of those places now closed or restricted um, from fishing for really no particular reason i mean it's like they they couldn't come into those areas where we're surf fishing and we're not catching rock fish or pelagic fish we're catching these fish that live there the corbina the spot fin, the elephant the perch they couldn't just come into us and say okay like we're concerned with the biomass just let everything go I mean, 90% of the surf fishermen let everything go anyway. So if they just came out and just said, hey, we're going to have this area. We want, you know, we're going to study it. So we're going to do a biomass study now. We're going to have you go in there for 10 years and catch and release. We're going to do another biomass study and then make a decision on whether people can keep fish or not. That would be completely acceptable to anglers. We'd be happy with that. But to come to us and say, we're going to completely close these places, <clears throat> A, and B, we're going to allow the these these God, what can we call them is like environmental mafia people who walk along the beach and harass you that's perfectly acceptable we're going to allow that to happen that's what they've done so not only do you not feel welcome going around there but you have no right to fish there or even recreate in a lot of places there so yes they have once again like we talked about before whether it was de facto closures with vandenberg air force base private property on the ocean camp pendleton those are all closed and then you add to those these mpa closures it really has hurt surf fishing in the long run especially in a sport where there's so much catch and release that it really has zero effect on the environment right well we talk we can talk about this till our head falls off. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. if we keep voting for who we keep voting for, it's going to keep happening. And you guys can't blame it on California. It's federal. It's a federal. Most of this stuff federally mandated. So you have to pay attention and you got to stop. You just have to. You just got to stop and wake up, gang. It's just, it's a like Jeanette just said, I don't know why, Jeanette. I don't know why they won't wake up. I don't know why they don't see the devastation. I mean, you look at what's going on right now in America and you just got to go, what What just happened? This happened in three years. It instantly happened in three years. And if you can't put your finger on what, why, then, then we got really no, we got no hope. We got no hope, unfortunately, if you can't put your finger on it. And this whole closure thing of the ocean, this has been going on for a very long time. And it takes a break every once in a while. And every the people that don't care about it when they're, they're running the shit, we get to breathe for a second. But right now we're under attack from every angle. But I want to make sure that you understand we still get to fish. And I want you all to go out there and enjoy this sport and take your children and take your grandchildren and get out there and get Bill's calendar, get Bill's book. Understand that just because fuel's $7 a gallon right now, that's not time to start stop fishing. We need to get down there on the beaches. We need to show them that we want to fish. That's why we're talking about the rest of the show today is all the great areas that are still left that you can fish. Down there in San Diego, there's big giant areas that you can still fish for a little bit longer. They're on a mission to close them all. But right now, there's a lot of bitching areas to fish down there too. And you say San Onofre, hasn't most of San Onofre though, except dead center right in front of the power plant, hasn't most of that been open now for 
quite a while since they mm -hmm. shut down the power plant. Yeah, that area, really all around that area has been open for years. Um, it's just been an accessibility question there. And, and people who are familiar with where to park and where the trails are and all that, you know, have been the ones who've gone down there and taken advantage of that. Um, so hopefully a little bit of that accessibility issue will be will change over time. But but we've got great surf fishing conditions right now. There's there's no question about it. You know, surf fishing right now all along the Southern California coast from from, let's say, gosh, I, I would say, you know, Santa Barbara all the way to the Mexican border has just been phenomenal. I mean, it is as good right now as it is normally in the summer. And I, and I do encourage everyone to, who, who wants to surf fish, don't, don't wait till June, get, get down there as soon as you can. Um, just in the past few weeks, I've had an unbelievably good reports with lots everywhere from Malibu to Ken border, but the Corbina fishing has been outstanding. I got a report yesterday from Newport beach of a guy who caught two nice Corbina, one to 22 inches. He got four perch, barred surf perch. One was 16 inches. Um, and, and I'm getting these reports from Corbina really everywhere from Santa Barbara to San Diego right now. So excuse me, that will only get better as, as time goes on and the water warms up and more crabs come up to the surface, but it's been good already. And, and then, you know, weather-wise, I, I think a large reason for that is, is that as we go through the remainder of this month, we go into the beginning of next month, we have a small swell that's making its way up here. We're seeing it today um, coming from, um, really Australia. I mean, it's come that far away to come up here. So it's pushing all that warm water, clear water from the south toward the north. We normally don't see that until we get into to maybe late May into June and then throughout the summer. So that's already happening here. And then we have a number of storms that are coming out of the west. It looks like we're going to see some rain in Southern California this weekend. And those storms, they normally come out of the Aleutian Islands in, in Alaska, make their way down the British Columbia coast. Well, what we're seeing is that there's a couple that are making their way down that traditional route for these winter storms, but many more are making their way over toward Hawaii and then coming in from the west. So we don't have that cold water push that we'd normally see this time of year down the coast. The water temperature has been right around 60 degrees all the way from San Diego to Santa Barbara, which is amazing to see Santa Barbara's water temperature so warm. It never, Santa Barbara never really went other than one or two days below 59 degrees this year when we should see it around 54 degrees up there. So the water's been particularly warm. The surf fishing has been good and get the heck out there because it's just going to get better as the spring comes along. I believe so. We had a lot of my friends, you know, run yachts down here in Cabo. And yesterday they had phenomenal Dorado fishing. The water is 73, 74 <laughs> degrees down here. And it's the middle of March, gang. It's usually in the um, mid 60s down here. It's and, and our good friend that we had on here, Wes, I don't know if you've been watching him, but he's just having a time of his life catching rooster fish day and day. And the Sierra fishing is insane. This is all really, really weird. If you don't think there's an El Nino, you got to look down here at what's going on, gang. It is just amazing the amount of fish that are biting down here. And it's supposed to be winter time. And we have 74, 75 degree water, 72. Doesn't get any lower than 72 anywhere down here. And that's pretty amazing for March. And as you climb up the coast, I talk to my buddy Brian Woolley on the Sun Fun bill all the time. They didn't have anything. I Yeah, like you said, a couple days, but really nothing under 60 degrees all winter long with all the storms and the gnarliness and all the craziness that went on the water never got cold now it's spring i wanted to ask you a question about this corvina because i remember as a kid going to the beach at t street or at the san clemente pier and i could see them in the surf how hard is it to get those fish that you see to bite? Is it like trout fishing? Once they you see them, they've already seen you and they're not going to bite, or is it different? You know, I would say, you know, as you move on in your career of surf fishing and get a little bit better at it, you get an ability to be more stealth. 
But I think, Dave, you're right in a lot of cases, not when you're standing on the pier looking down at Corbina, but when you're down in their zone, that they probably see you or feel your movement before you see them. And there will be many times where you'll see one right out in front of you when you're, of course, walking down the beach hunting for them, and you'll cast in front of it, and it will actually kind of even look at you up the beach like, are you kidding me? I'm not going after that. So, so yeah, they, they do have amazing eyesight. And the thing is, is that, you know, they, they have that little barbell on their chin and they rub that in the sand. Well, remember when we were kids and we would watch these, these movies, these cowboy and Indian movies, and the Indian would put his ear to the train track and he could hear the train well before he could see it. Exactly the same idea with Corbina. They could feel movement all around them by having their chin down into the sand on the bottom. And, and I do think there's occasion where they see you long before you see them. Yeah. And I'm so glad that I was able to ask, because I keep forgetting to ask you that question, because many times I did exactly what you said. I had the sand crab, the soft shell one. I dug through the sand. I found the soft shell one. I had the tiny, tiny sinker. I had the perfect hook. I had four pound line and I made the most exceptional cast but he wouldn't eat it. And, and then because I'm a spaz on the beach, I'm jumping up. When I see him, I'm like running towards him. So now it's starting to make sense. That whisker, we call it a little whisker, but again, if you ever seen one, like Bill said, they have like a little piece of skin hanging down. looks mm -hmm. like a whisker. That's to pick up the vibration. It's all starting to make sense to me now. I could, oh my goodness. Yeah. Dave, Dave, have you, have you ever noticed the same behavior I mean, it, 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 our method for swordfish fishing has changed. But do, how many times have you seen the same behavior with swordfish when you're on the bow of the boat and your buddy gets you in the perfect position to launch a, a wild mackerel out there and it splashes in front of the swordfish and you just think, you know, I got it. And that swordfish, he, he takes his bill and he flips it back toward the boat and he gives you a look like, are you seriously kidding me? And swims away. I mean, that's what the Corbina do. They're, they're, you know, in swordfish, that's what these smarter fish do. They, they look for what occurs naturally in the area where they live, and that's what they eat. You know, a swordfish doesn't get to three, four, five hundred pounds by being stupid and just eating anything that floats by it. And that's the same with fish in the surf. You know, a, a 22 inch corbina is probably 15 years old. And it's not like a dorado that grows to 10 times its size in a year. It grows slowly and it doesn't eat anything that just floats by it. It looks for what occurs naturally in the area where it lives. Very, very wily fish. Gain. I was asked this or told a statement a couple of weeks ago about Bill and I don't give you enough credit. And so I'm going to try to do this right now. Gang, you got to check out his book. Now I don't have the QR code to your book, but I got the QR code to your calendar, which takes you right to your store. Gang, his book is incredible. If you enjoy listening to Bill talk, you're going to love this read. It's an incredible book. You want to check it out. So many of our our fans and our members and everybody just love your book. Just absolutely enjoy it. To, and they, they mentioned, Dave, you don't talk about Bill's book enough. And I apologize, Bill, because you do me a big favor by being on your own Wednesdays. Gang, if you haven't seen Bill's book, Bill's going to talk about it for a few seconds here in his tackle. Everything he has on his website is to make you catch that Corvina on the beach or that perch or whatever. So talk about that for just a minute. Yeah, you know, um, gosh, I, I'm really lucky. You know, back back in the '60s, um, so I was I was 10 in 1968, and I when I was nine, I thought I worked at this tackle shop, TC's Bait and Tackle in Redondo, and I would go down there and hang out there when I I'd go fishing in the morning, then hang out there for a few hours. The owner introduced me to this guy, Fred Oakley, who caught all the bait on the West Coast for all the tackle shops from Santa Barbara to San Diego. He caught sidewinder crabs, soft shell sand crabs, mussel, clams, opali moss. I mean, he just go on and on and all the stuff he used to deliver there. 
And so we would surf fish together. He held a bunch of records at that time. He actually held the largest mako shark ever caught at that time, which he caught from shore in Santa Monica, 367 pound mako shark on the beach. <laughs> you can imagine how exciting that must have been. Um, and so I joined a fishing club around um, 1989. Um, that was a great club, West Coast Anglers, fantastic. And and so my buddy said, you know so much about surf fishing because we'd go down surf fishing one weekend, another weekend we'd be bass fishing in the lake, and another weekend we'd be offshore getting tuna, we'd go down to the East Cape. We did all the, Alaska, we did all these things in our club, and they said, you should write a book about it. So I, I, I wrote this book. And I didn't, I just took everything I knew about surf fishing. I grew up at the beach in Hermosa Beach. I surf fished before I met Fred Oakley. I fished after him. And I wrote every single thing I knew about surf fishing in this book and, and just took all the knowledge I had and tried to put it in this book because Fred said to me one day before he passed away, that if we don't teach people about surf fishing, nobody will do it anymore. And, and really, it, it had gone from a very, very popular thing in the 1950s that by the time 1980 came along, hardly anybody was at the beach surf fishing. So I wrote this book. I put in everything I knew about surf fishing, about all the different fish, the rigging, equipment, how to find fish on the beach, how to catch bait, what the different baits were, what you could get for free, all of those things. Trip surf fishing trips, how to make a ghost shrimp pump, every single thing I knew I put in that book. And thank God, and, and believe it or not, that book has sold 55,000 copies. Um, and people have come up to me, people have bought it from all over the country, but people have come up to me at the shows, just, just like you, Dave, and, and thank me, told me how much better they have gotten. So many people have come up over the years and said, hey, I want to take this up and I got your book or I'm buying it today. And then I'd maybe see them at the next year at the show or the year after. And they say, hey, Bill, look at this fish I caught. Oh, my gosh. And I'd look at it. It's a bigger spot than that I'd ever caught in my life. So it really makes you feel good when you go out there and give people information, something that's such a soulful, fun thing to do, and they go out there and they really find a passion for it. It's what brings us together as a community. So I, I do encourage everybody. I mean, the book is less than $20. It, it's got every single thing in it that I've ever known about surf fishing. And if you just read it and apply some of the things that you learn, you too will be excellent at surf fishing. Good. I'm glad you said that because, gang, I kind of think that I kind of know kind of a little bit about fishing a little bit. And uh, I was very blessed that Bill and I both work with Pete Gray on his show a lot over the years. And I was able to meet Bill through Pete. And this had to be 20 years ago. And I was trying to this surf fishing thing was kicking my butt because I was watching the guys with the big pyramid sinker, throwing that bait out there as far as you could and putting mm -hmm. the rod in the rod. And for me, I got ADD. I got to, if I'm going to fish, I got to be holding the rod. I got to be moving up and down. Just like when I'm fly fishing a stream, I am moving. I am moving because I know when I get to the edge of the stream, if I screwed up and tripped or hit a branch or something, I know that pond is done because I already did, let the trout know I'm there. So I'm on my way to the next one. And I was sitting with you. I, you probably don't even remember, but we were at the Del Mar show. You were hanging out in Pete's booth. And the next thing I know, I'm just like mesmerized listening to you. And then I got your book and I started to, and I was like, man, I did everything I could possibly do wrong surf fishing. I did every single thing wrong. And as I started to apply the things that I learned from Bill, and at the time I was living on the beach in San Clemente and right above the state park. And all of a sudden I was down there in the mornings catching fish and that's all, when I go fishing, that's all I want to do is catch a fish. I, I really, a lot of you go, oh, I like the experience, like being out there. I like how pretty it is. Not me. I want to catch. I'm sorry. It, I just want to figure out why I wasn't catching. And when I started to listen to Mr. Barney, it all came together and it all made sense. And I put, and I know it's hard for you, though, most of you that know me, I put my ego in my pocket for a few minutes and I listened to Bill and it helped tremendously. So check out the book, gang. You can grab it through that QR code right now. Bill, do you got any of those calendars left or are we all out of them? Yeah, I've got a, I've got a few of the, 
I've got probably a hundred more of the calendars left out of 3000. We've got maybe a hundred left. And then this, this is a look at the book. I know everything's backwards on the screen there, but surfishing the light line revolution. Um, you pick it up at just about every single tackle shop in California and you get it online at surfishtackle.com. And, uh, it's, it's very easy to read. It's about 230 pages long. It's got lots of pictures in it. And one thing that all of us old people like is the lettering, the writing is larger than you would normally find in most books. So it's very easy to read. And then you can just take the information and go right down to the beach and apply it. Um, and, and I must be honest with you, Dave, you know, as far as my book is concerned, I learn to freshwater fish the same way that a lot of people learn from this book and, and you too. I knew nothing. I, I had from a, being a little kid had freshwater fished around mammoth mammoth area in the Sierra Nevadas and, and, and some local lakes, of course, my whole life. And I was, you know, as a kid, I was okay at it, but I really didn't have a passion. I really hadn't figured it out. I met some buddies in my club who were really good freshwater anglers. I asked them to take me, you know, smallmouth, largemouth bass fishing and trout fishing. And you know what I learned, Dave? I learned exactly what you said. I learned all the things I was doing wrong. And once I learned what I was doing incorrectly, and once I'd been given just a few techniques of what I could do in freshwater to be a better angler, you know, whether it was um, uh, uh, using flies or, or pulling something behind the boat that I was trolling with for, for big trout or, or bass fishing techniques, brass and glass, different worms and shapes to use. My, my freshwater fishing just exploded. And, and now I can go down to a freshwater area and act like I'm some kind of expert or teacher when other people are involved, which is great because I can show people what I've learned and become better at it. And that's the same thing with the, the book and surf fishing is it, it, it's like learning to drive a car. You can read a book about it, but when your dad sits you down in the car and spends 20 minutes with you driving, you learn in 20 minutes way more than you would ever learn from reading. So look at the book, learn a few things from the book, go down to the edge of the water, and that's where you'll really be able to experience it. And then, of course, in the summer, we have surf fishing clinics right on the beach. You come down to the beach. We spend about three hours fishing with a group of people on the beach. We provide all of the bait, all the instructions. And believe me, in a couple hours, you'll learn way more than you would learn on your own in months, weeks, maybe even years. Yeah, there you go, gang. Somebody was saying they can't use the QR code. Well, Bill just showed you the book. Now, you know, one more time, Bill, real slow, because there's a lot of people that aren't watching that can are listening. Just let them know how can they get a good hold of the book. So the book, once again, is Surf Fishing, The Light Line Revolution, because we use really light line, really trout gear now. You can find that at most every tackle shop in California and also online at Surf Fish Tackle. Dot com. And on my store, surffishtackle.com, I only sell products that I use every day on the beach. I don't sell stuff on there just to make money. It's only the stuff I use on the beach. It's very reasonably priced, if not the least. And of course, there's I'm in Colorado, so I'm sending it from here. There's no tax. So it's a real savings. There you go, gang. So now you know. Bill, we're in this, I know we don't have much time, but we're in springtime now. Mm -hmm. And you kind of said Corvina, Corvina. Is this going to be Corvina right now until the water gets warmer? Or we're going to be fishing those perch. We're going to be fishing halibut. We're going to be fishing leopard sharks. Pretty much everything's going to bite now because we're getting in as it's starting to warm up. Absolutely. Everything is biting right now. Um, I did three days ago. I saw a 20 pound halibut out of the surf. We've got these huge perch right now. Corbina, something we normally wouldn't see now are, are really good. There's been some really good spot fin croaker and yellowfin croaker fishing right at the jetties at Newport and also at the cliff in Huntington Beach. Those have both been some really good spots in the last three weeks or so. 
So, I, I mean, Dave, it's weird. We, normally this time of year, we would be dealing with kind of the end of perch and kind of the beginning of yellowfin croaker. And, and there would be some spot fin, but maybe not another corbina for a month or so. It's like we're plopped right down the middle of summer and it's not going to get worse. It's going to get better because once that water warms up just a couple more degrees, these sand crabs are going to come up by the billions along the beach. All of these fish are going to come in and feed on those. On top of that stuff, we've got the grunion runs going. Um, I don't know if you've seen some of this video. I, I'm somebody who gets a lot of this video from the beach um this video recently of the last grunion run in huntington beach and in seal beach was phenomenal i saw some grunion run footage that was up in uh, the santa monica area where there were literally I, I mean it looked like hundreds of thousands of of grunion on the beach and wherever those come in the the striper the spot fin the big yellowfin croaker and halibut sea bass are all going to be following that stuff into shore and feeding there so we've got some phenomenal surf fishing now it's just going to get better as time goes on and we're, we're hours up gang i know that but bill the grunion if somebody i mean we already talked about the politics and the whole thing and they changed it now to you can have 30 and they're probably pushing to make it zero but if you have never witnessed this grunion run gang it is something to, that is just you got to go see it once and there's every, there's a lot of websites that post when the grunion run me personally and i fished with grunion for a very long time since i was a teenager used them for bait it was super important my children grew up using them for bait my wife's both used them for bait and uh when you take your family down to the grunion run and you see it first it's going to absolutely blow your mind these fish literally beach themselves to have babies. They get out of the water and they beach themselves by Bill saying the hundreds of thousands. It's just absolutely amazing. And when you sit there, I want you to go down there. If you're not going to take them, go set a beach chair and a flashlight and just sit there and watch. And then you'll go, there's no reason to have a limit on these things. <laughs> It'll show you that there's 0, 0.0 science involved in this, but they found out that Bill Barney and Dave Hansen enjoyed grunion mm -hmm. hunting. So they said, nope, you can't have as many as you want. And it was as many as you want. You could have as many as you want, as many as you want. And it never, ever affected the population. But then they found out Bill and Dave were smiling, laughing and having a good time on the beach. And they were like, nope, can't have that anymore. So now you're allowed 30. It's kind of crazy, but you got to go you, see it. You, you right? do. And, and you know, what's phenomenal. I mean, you really, you know, Dave, if you love the ocean, you love the marine environment, you're maybe you're an angler and you have a passion for it. They are such an amazing fish. I, I mean, first of all, this this whole predation and, and human interaction with them, hurting them is baloney. Think about when you catch a trout, okay, big trout, small trout, and you go to let that trout go. You barely touch that darn thing, and it can hardly swim away, and you often wonder to yourself if it's going to survive. Then you think of a grunion. Then you see a, a grunion, right? These animals, they beat themselves from shore. They get slammed on the beach from a wave. They come completely out of the water. They dig themselves into the sand out of the water for a while. I mean, I'm not talking 10 seconds, 15 seconds. We're talking minutes here. They dig themselves down. They, they lay their eggs in. They lay their milt in. They somehow work themselves out of the sand. They wait for a wave to come up and get back into the water and swim away like it's just another day in the life of a grunion. It's an amazing fish. I mean, other than sharks who, who are super resilient and we've had them out of the water for an hour and they swim away, there really are no other fish in the marine environment, whether it's freshwater or saltwater, um, that are as resilient, strong at, as these grunion are. So, so they're really a remarkable fish and that's what makes fishing so great and such a passion for so many people. Absolutely. The grunion are the, 
the coolest fish in California by far. If you haven't experienced it yet, look at the Grunion runs. My personal history with the Grunion is the second and third nights are always the very, very best. Mm -hmm. The first mm -hmm. night, a lot of times you miss. The last night, it's kind of over. They've done their deal. They're not. But that myth, those two nights in the middle, those are the best two nights to go because that's something about it. And there's beaches and you can go online and you can learn which beaches. If the beach is full of rocks, there's not going to be any grunting. It has to be sand. They have to be able to go into the sand. A lot of the beaches that they used to go to, they don't have any sand anymore. But like Bill was saying, they're dredging them now. They're bringing them back to where they were in the 50s. Unfortunately, a lot of environmentalists don't want that, but it's just uh, whatever. We already talked about this enough, but you got to go experience it. What the best thing I would say would go look at your beach that you're thinking about going to. And if it doesn't have a lot of sand, if it's a lot of gravel, don't go to that beach. Come Go to the beaches that are a lot of sand. There's websites you can go and learn where they are. You can look at Bill. You can listen to what he has to say. You can listen to me. We'll steer you in the right direction. But we want your family to experience this fish. It's unbelievable. And they come right out on the sand. You can't pick them up with anything but your hands. But there's many nights back in the day when you could have as many as you want where me and my boys would catch a 1,000 in a night. And I wouldn't waste one of them. They would all go home with us in the ice chest. They would all be bagged in Ziploc bags because every one of those is gold. That's a fish. I don't know what fish going to eat it. It's like the um, like the ghost like, shrimp. Ghost shrimp, right. The, who's going to eat it? The first one that gets to it. Yeah. And we have extraordinary fishing in the reddest red tide you could possibly imagine with those things. They're just, an un, like Bill said, super resilient, bitching little fish. And you all got to see it. You all want to check it out. Gang, do us, Bill and I, a big favor. Hit the share button down on the bottom of your Facebook page on where it shows comments. There's a little swoosh button, little swoosh looking arrow thing. Hit that and share this with all your friends. Everybody needs to know what's coming down the pipe in the United States of America, how they're going to close fishing. Do us a favor and just hit. You don't know. One of those people may be connected somewhere and they may be able to stop this. I don't know. But what we're doing now does not work. We need to remove head from rectum and start getting more involved because we got to keep this fishing thing open. That's why this show was so important to me today. And that's why I spent so much time with my buddy Bill talking about it. We're both super positive. We love all of you, but we got to do something. We got to get this. So share, 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 please share. Bill, thank you so much for being on the show with me today. I'll see you next Wednesday. Great. Yes. Can't look forward to it. Look All forward right. to it. We'll have a we'll have a new report and an update on what our conditions are like. Yay! Yeah, and get ready, gang. This weekend's going to be. If you want to get some phenomenal f video content, the waves are going to be incredible. The wind is going to be twenty-seven to thirty-five knots of wind on yeah. Sunday morning on the beach. Mm -hmm. All day Saturday, it's going to blow. So by the time Sunday comes, the waves are going to be incredible. You're going to get some phenomenal content. If you can't join us. Make sure you get some content and send it to me and Bill next Wednesday and we'll check it out. It's going to be an incredible weekend of weather. Do not go fishing this weekend. Stay on <laughs> That's land. That's right. That's Stay right. Stay on land. We don't want to read about you.